All right, cool. Um, so thanks, uh, thanks, folks, for coming. Uh, my name is Brian Desmond. I am a, a principal at a firm called Ravenswood Technology Group, based out of uh, based out of Chicago, and I spend uh, most of my time kind of focused these days talking about the Microsoft security and identity stack. And uh, today, what I wanted to talk about is some of the things that are that are built into primarily into Azure AD, which, uh, if uh, if you're not familiar with it, is Microsoft's cloud identity offering. And some of the what I would call quick wins with it, you're spending uh, spending a whole bunch of money per month or on an annualized basis on your uh, on your enterprise agreement with it. How can you how can you take this and get some uh, get some quick wins that that deliver value uh, relatively quickly, and then um, take it from uh, take it from there. If uh, this is a pretty small room, so if you've got questions, you've got ideas, feel free to uh, feel free to jump in. It's actually uh, kind of boring to just stand up here and talk. Uh, Talk uh, without pausing for the next hour or so. So uh, feel free to make this uh, make this interactive, and uh, it makes it a lot more fun for me and uh, valuable for everyone else. I think. And okay, uh, maybe we're not using this thing. Uh, I think I got ahead of myself. Uh, my contact info is there up on the uh, up on the slide. It'll be up on the end as well. If you've got uh, got questions or follow ups, uh, always feel free to uh, feel free to reach out. Um, but as I was putting this together, I grabbed a few screenshots, some of which might uh, might look a little dated. But uh, as we've looked at this kind of uh, this Microsoft identity journey, um, this was uh, this was probably the beginning of uh, of my time with uh, with this stack. And uh, if you don't recognize this, this was the tool that you used to make uh, PDCs and BDCs with uh, with NT4. Uh, hopefully, you don't have any of that around. Although I just talked to a customer the other day that does. Uh, so uh, so things live on. And then uh, we built this uh, this DC promo thing. This one is maybe Windows 2003-ish, um, somewhere along the somewhere along the way. And then uh, and then that got reskinned into the same thing with uh, with fancy new colors in 2012 R2-ish. Um, and then now we've got this uh, this fancy identity thing in the cloud with lots of uh, lots of cool lines and graphs and uh, lots of features that we will uh, will dive into. But um, it's certainly been uh, been a bit bit of an interesting journey. And as much as uh, as much of this Azure AD stuff is the new shiny thing that certainly all your uh, Microsoft salespeople want to talk to you about, um, all the stuff that's uh, that's behind it, I realize, is not going uh, going anywhere anytime soon. And so, before we talk about all the uh, all the fancy kind of cloud stuff, I wanted to recap some of the some of the on-premises pieces, and maybe, or maybe not. Um, I can talk about that, and uh, maybe someone will sort the uh, sort the screen out because uh, it works on mine. Um, but all the uh, all the identity bits that um, that go up into Azure AD. Are uh, are all started and all mastered with your on-premises directory. I'll leave you guys to that. Um, so all these identities are uh, are mastered from your on-premises Active Directory. And if your house isn't in order where it all uh, where it all starts, it's all kind of irrelevant what you're uh, what you're doing in the cloud because all those problems that that you start with on-premises, those are just going to trickle downhill, and they're going to turn into problems that you have now in uh, in two different places. And um, so a lot of the work, uh, a lot of the work that I do these days, uh, surprisingly enough, is still all around on-premises AD. And a lot of it, rather than being around kind of the nuts and bolts of let's go put some new group policies or some new OUs or domain controllers or something like that, that used to be uh, used to be all this fun stuff that we would talk about at conferences, has turned into how do I secure this thing that I've had for ten, maybe twenty years at this point, and how do I keep it, um, how do I keep it up and running? And how do I keep it secure? And how do I protect that estate? And uh, we'll find out if the TV's on or not. Um, and the other thing that I uh, that I like to tell people about this, especially customers that are early in their early in their cloud journey, is that while it's really important to have that on-premises infrastructure in a safe and a healthy and a secure manner, the last thing you also want to do is stop everything you're doing about that cloud journey, cloud adoption, to make sure that every possible thing is in line, every possible thing is ready, because you will never finish that project. And meanwhile, the sales guys that have sold your executives this new fancy cloud thing will be collecting on something that you're never going to use, because it's never going to be just perfect enough that we can get there. Okay. Um, so I guess we'll. Uh, we'll yes. Yeah, he's already got one. 
Yeah. Um, so uh, we were talking about stuff other than TVs. We were. We were. OK. Um, so as far as uh, kind of securing on-premises infrastructure, stuff where that all begins, um, there's a couple things that I usually talk to, uh, talk to customers about. And I've heard it alluded to in some of, the, uh, some of the sessions today. And one of those is this concept of this thing called the clean source principle. And the idea with clean source is that take AD, for example. If I'm managing AD from a system that's compromised or that's dirty, then transitively, I've also made AD potentially compromised or potentially dirty. And the solution for that, um, that that Microsoft often talks about, that we talk about to our customers, is this concept of privileged access workstations or secure access workstations. And the idea is that I take this machine that's uber locked down, and I've removed all the possible control points where I could potentially compromise that to compromise AD. And now I've removed one of the really common avenues of attack or, or venues that I can use to get to AD. And not only do I use that to, uh, to secure AD, but I can extend that to things like cloud properties. I can say that in order to manage Office 365, in order to manage Azure, in order to manage AWS, take your pick of that system. I need to use one of these uber lockdown systems called a privileged access workstation. And this adds a ton of overhead in practice, operationalizing these things. They sound really, really good on the one slide or that talks about how this is great and it's going to make you much more secure. But it's one of those things that, on some level, you're going to have to do. And unfortunately, it sucks that you're going to have to do it. But um, the number of attacks that are out there, the number of things that have happened uh, in, in practice, where someone's taken a machine that you use day to day, that you use to browse the internet, that you use to do all your tasks, and take that over is um, it's unfortunately an ever-increasing list. So that whole concept of clean source, making sure that I only manage something from something that I know hasn't been compromised and isn't, um, isn't an avenue to, uh, to be compromised is really important. And then along the same vein is this concept of what Microsoft calls their tiered access model, which is segmenting administrative access to the different levels of systems that are in your environment. So if you think about today, if you treat everything that's joined your AD domain as one thing, in reality, the levels of assurance, the levels of security for those are completely different. The level of assurance that you run your domain controllers at is hopefully a heck of a lot higher than the level of assurance that that desktop that someone, uh, an information worker, someone that works in your organization uses. And if you think about that one of those information worker machines has been compromised, if I now sign into it with a domain admin credential, because they've called, they've said that something bad has happened to it, it's not working, so I take my admin credential and I sign into it, I've probably just given away the keys to the kingdom and effectively have, uh, have created an avenue where the entire environment has been owned. So what the tiering model does is it says that you separate all the assets you have into three different buckets or three different groups or tiers. Tier zero, you can think of as systems that control the environment, that own the environment. So typically those are AD, their identity and access management systems, it's ADFS, it's ping, it's Azure AD Connect, PKI, all those things that if I can own this, I can own practically only system on the network, we think of that as tier zero. And then the next tier is tier one. Tier one is all your apps, all your data, all your member servers. We segment all those off. Those run at a lower assurance level than we would necessarily run tier zero, but certainly they run at a higher assurance level than our final tier, which is tier two. And that's all the client computers that are out running on the network. And so this is great. We've segmented all these. And as part of that, in practice, what we have to do is we actually put technical controls in place, typically with group policy, another thing that's been around forever that lives on. And we say that across each of these tiers, I actually have a different administrative identity that I use to manage tier zero. Then if I also manage member servers, I also have a tier one admin account. And finally, if I manage end user computers, client computers, I have a tier two admin account as well. And what I do with the group policies, I actually make sure that nobody can accidentally or purposefully try to cross those tiers. By doing that, I make sure that a domain admin account or even a tier one, a member server admin account, never touches a lower assurance machine, which is like a, uh, like a client computer. I didn't get the email yet. You didn't get the email yet. Uh, 
it left my outbox, so we'll. Uh, we'll yeah. No worries. Um, and the, the big thing with the tiering is it, it helps solve for two things. One, you want to make sure that people can't move laterally within a tier. Moving laterally means I start on one client computer or one member server, and I move to another one within that tier. I got your out of office message, so yeah, progress. Um, and then I also don't want to be able to move S or I don't want to be able to escalate across tiers. So typically, the way these attack patterns work, I compromise, let's say, an end user workstation. Now I'm going to hop laterally from workstation to workstation until I can find a venue where I can get a credential that can get me to a higher tier. That's me escalating. Now I've escalated to a member server in tier one. I'm going to do the same thing, hopping from machine to machine. And eventually, I'm going to try and escalate to get to tier zero. And that's that point that I've essentially owned the entire environment. What these controls are meant to do is meant to prevent those things from happening, or at least make it much harder for that to happen, make it much harder for a potential adversary. So the, there's a bunch of work involved in doing this. Again, it's, security isn't necessarily easy, but this is protecting some of that on-premises estate that sets the foundation for all the cloud identity infrastructure that you have. Almost. Almost. Yeah. All right. What slide are you on? Uh, I am on slide number nine. Um, so in terms of implementing this segmentation or implementing this tiering, there's typically a bunch of back-end work that has to happen because it's not just about things like administrative IDs. You also have to think about things that violate clean source. And clean source isn't just about having those privileged access workstations, but there's other, other potential venues that I can use to, to elevate. A really common example, if you have something like SCCM or an endpoint management solution, has those agents that are installed on your domain controllers, they're installed on your member servers, they're installed on your client computers, I bet it's probably run by your desktop team. But if I can compromise that system, I can compromise anything that it can run code on. The, really, the obvious example in the context of this discussion is AD. At that point, I own everything. So implementing this tiering means not just things like admin accounts and um, implementing things like pause, but it also means that I might have to duplicate infrastructure. I might have to take something like SCCM, for example, where I have potentially three different, uh, three different instances that I need to be able to run it at the different assurance levels that are necessary to implement that, those tiers. And so the, the complicated part here tends to be, how do I start picking apart these different agents, picking apart these different pieces, so they can actually draw lines in the sand and call what, uh, what all these different tiers are. And uh, so when we do these projects, we always start with tier zero. That's where the most, uh, most important part of the estate is, the most important set of assets that we want to protect. And then logically, people typically think, well, once I'm done with tier zero, I'll go with tier one, and then I'll go with tier two, because um, as those tiers get lower or higher in numbers, the case may be, it must be uh, more important. I can tell you from experience in a large enterprise that tier one bucket is a really big piece of work that few people have any hope of finishing. So if you can get tier zero done, you can typically get tier two done with, relatively, with a relatively achievable project. And then tier one often turns into, let's put anything new in there. Let's take our highest risk 10 or 15 apps. Let's put that in there. Then we've got all this other stuff over here. Let's be realistic. We're probably never going to get it done. All right. What's next? Hey, and the space bar works. And the TV still works. I am doing good. Um, so that was my, uh, my, first, uh, my first one here out of 10. The rest of these are all kind of new and shiny cloud stuff, but I like to start with that. If you don't secure what you already have today, all this new stuff that you're going to put in is going to run at that same lower level of assurance, lower, lower level of security, and potential compromise that, uh, that the on-premises infrastructure that you have is running at. So the rest of these are kind of stack ranked in terms of how easy these tend to be to roll out. Um, but before I talk about the actual, the actual technical bits, 
Um, three things that I want to make sure I, I cover off on, because this is really important from a project planning perspective. Um, first off, momentum makes these things happen. If you can get wins, and then you can get more wins, and you can keep going, you've got a ton of momentum. Even when you hit roadblocks, you're going to keep going. But as soon as you take pauses for little roadblocks that come up, you take pauses for whatever other reason, these projects tend to fall apart, they get deprioritized, um, and it's no different than any other IT project, but that momentum builds, uh, builds success. Next one, as far as business value, a lot of these are really easy to quantify. Some of them are a little harder to quantify, but uh, as we look at some of these, there's clear numbers that you can tie to what success will drive for, uh, drive for you. And then finally, as you set foundations, you can build on top of those. And we'll talk about if we have, uh, have a little bit of time at the end, hey, you start to take some of these kind of tactical wins, you piece them together, and now you have these really great stories that cross a whole bunch of different things. So my first uh, and favorite one, this is one we've been talking about for, uh, well, forever. Um, and analysts love selling data about this. Every time someone calls your help desk, it costs $43, or a kitten dies, or whatever the, the statistic of the, uh, of the week is. They all seem to come up with a different number every time they issue a report. But no matter how you multiply it together, it's a really big number. And so one of those foundational features that is in Azure AD Premium is self-service password reset and self-service account unlock. And if you can do the math and you can quantify getting people to use this rather than calling up and say, you know, I just spent two weeks on the beach, might have had a few margaritas, don't have a clue what the hell my password was before I, uh, before I went out on vacation, you can show some value. Um, the key things for this are you've got to change behavior. If you just turn this thing on, but everybody still picks up the phone and calls 1-800, whatever your help desk number is, you haven't done anything, and there's not, uh, there's not much point. So to do that, there's, uh, there's, there's two pieces. One is there's this little switch that says, next time everyone signs in, they have to be forced to enroll for self-service password reset. Whether that's setting up the authenticator app, that's answering security questions, that's providing their phone number, whichever options you choose, everybody's got to do that because it's useless if they go to use it for the first time. It says, well, you can't use it because you've never set it up before, so call the help desk. And then the second one is the help desk has to be in the business of saying no which depending on where you work, I have some customers where the help desk is famous for saying no and no one's quite sure why they exist. That's great for this scenario. Then there's the other one where they bend over backward and do anything it needs to get that five on the satisfaction survey if you just stay on the line right after the call. They can't do that anymore. You've got to change behavior. You've got to get people to actually use this for it to be useful. Um, and then finally, something that's changed in the past, uh, past couple months is that they have converged the MFA and SSPR, the multi-factor authentication and self-service password reset registrations, into one thing. So now it's if you're thinking about, I'm going to roll out MFA, I'm going to roll out SSPR, they're not two separate enrollments. It's actually one bucket of data. If I'm enrolled in one, I'm ready to use the other. So one of the big kind of end user facing changes there is that they can now use the authenticator app on their phone to proof up for password reset. Aside from this, the rest of the questions there are decisions that you have to make about things like what mechanisms will I allow for password reset and so forth tend to be, uh, tend to be really straightforward and less so of a business decision or a technical decision, but the big thing is how do I get people to actually use this? Uh, another one kind of second on my or third on my hit list is getting single sign-on in place to applications. Um, the number of really large enterprise customers I work with where people still have piles of passwords, even in 2018, is fairly shocking. If you have Azure AD, you can enable single sign-on to any app that supports SAML, that supports WSFed, that supports OAuth. Or even if you've got that app that sits over in the corner that has its own silo, they have a password replay plugin for IE and for Chrome. End users can vault their creds in it for the first time they hit the app, and then it will fill them in and click the submit button for them going forward. So it's not really single sign-on, but it, it kind of looks like it.
Yeah, so where do you find the plugin? It, um, the the myapps.microsoft page will prompt you to install it on IE or Chrome the first time you hit an app, or you can push it, uh, push it down. Um, and that's uh, kind of taking a sidebar here, but is also an interesting feature for systems that use shared passwords. So like corporate marketing platforms are a really good example of this. How many people in your company's marketing department know the password to the company's Twitter account? Chances are it's a whole bunch of people. Um, and when one of them leaves, if they're really pissed off when they leave, uh, they can make kind of bad things show up on Twitter should they wish to. One of the, uh, one of the functions that's here is opposed, aside from vaulting a separate password for every single person, you can also vault one set of creds that are shared across a whole bunch of people. And so the nice thing there is that people don't actually have to know the password. Twitter's a good example. And for three or four different, um, different properties, Azure AD will actually change that password behind the scenes for you on a regular basis. So as far as, uh, as, far as rolling this out, um, usually when I work with customers around this, we look at a couple different buckets of things. They might have a list of, some people have 10 or 20 apps, that's a really achievable number. Some people have 100 or 200, some people have 500 or 1,000. As those numbers get bigger, it becomes, uh, it starts to become a lot murkier. How are we gonna actually get this done? How are we gonna onboard all these different apps? And as you think about, um, you think about momentum, there's usually two buckets of apps that we, we try to start with. First one are high volume apps. What are those sites, those applications that everybody uses? Is it payroll? Is it time clocks? Is it, uh, is it expenses? Is it something like that? And then the, uh, the second one are high risk applications. Maybe only 10 or 20 people use this, but if something bad happened with the data that's in this app, what would happen to the organization? Is it, I see a lot of companies have outsourced services that they use to put, uh, put data together for board meetings. It's all sorts of juicy stuff that's in there. And chances are everybody's just using a standalone, standalone cred to access that. So it might not be a, a win that everybody uses, but from a risk perspective, that's really high risk data. And once you can get single sign-on on, we'll talk about how we layer on things like multi-factor authentication controls to add even, uh, even more security to this. Um, another one that's fun with this is, oddly enough, the app vendors that support this, they'll probably be a big pain for you. Many of them like to make this really difficult or they charge little ransoms and fees to actually turn on things like single sign-on in, uh, in their application. Depending on how many of these you have to do, it might not seem like a lot, but 1,000 or 2,500 or 5,000 bucks are kind of the, the usual increments to turn this on. If you multiply that by 100 or 200 times, it's actually kind of a meaningful number that you probably didn't budget for for, uh, for your application or for your project. This is so they can do less work for you and have less risk too, for a fee. Um, there is a certain travel and expense management platform that I bet many of you booked your trip here on or are gonna put your expenses in. They are famous for being one of the most difficult ones that I know that we work with all the time to, uh, to deal with this. And yet, what company wants to not have people use their corporate creds to pay their corporate card? Like that, that logic doesn't work for me, but uh, you know, I don't work there. Um, and then uh, the last one is uh, Fiddler. How many people have used Fiddler before? About two thirds of the room. If you haven't used it, it's a free download, getfiddler.com. You run it and then anything you do in your web browser, it shows you all the, the fun goo behind the scenes. And when you're troubleshooting single sign-on, you're troubleshooting SAML, WS Fed, it shows you what's actually happening. So when the vendor's telling you you're lying, because that's what they'll tell you, it's always your fault, you can say, actually, no, it's on you. Or you could say, yeah, you're right. <laughs> All right. Um, another one that, uh, that's really easy to turn on and is really easy from a change management perspective, typically, is what's called PIM, or Privileged Identity Management. And what PIM lets you do is a couple things. First off, you take everybody that's in one of your privileged roles in Azure AD or has privileged access to Azure resources, 
and you say that rather than having that access all the time, how about you can be eligible for that access, and when you actually need it, you can click a button, you can put the reason that you actually need that in, so that gets logged, and for a period of time, we'll elevate your access to be able to take advantage of that. When that period of time expires, we'll automatically strip it away until next time you need it. You can set different time windows, different requirements for every single, uh, every single role. Um, you can also set requiring approvals or multiple votes to, uh, to turn roles on. So I've seen some people say that for the role that controls actually managing who has access to these, it actually takes two people to turn that on. And uh, the other fun thing you can do with this is if you have this sprawl of global admins or people that have access to Azure AD or that have access to Azure, uh, Azure resources like virtual machines or compute workloads, whatever that is, you make all these people eligible to activate that, and then you get this report of when the last time all these roles were activated. And if after 60 or 90 days you see all these people have never used it, it makes it really hard for them to say, you know, I actually, I need that. I need that to do my job. Fact of the matter is, no, you actually just need that because it makes you feel important and powerful, but you're not actually using it. And now you've got empirical data that you never had before. Um, this, is, uh, this is one of those features where Microsoft likes to make a little bit of money on top of the money they're already getting from you. The nice thing is that you only need to license what's called Azure AD Premium P2 for the administrators that are going to use this. So whether that's 20 people that have access, that's 50 people, 100, 500, whatever the size of your organization is, you don't have to cover everyone just to get this feature. All right, so this is, uh, this is one of those unsung hero features. I know at least a couple of folks in the room have, uh, have bought into this uh, reasonably heavily. Um, so the Azure Application Proxy was kind of came out of, uh, if you're familiar with the Web Application Proxy role that comes with ADFS, this has some, some, some similarities that you'll, uh, you'll notice. And the whole story here is I can make traditional internet web applications, so things that run behind the firewall, securely accessible to people without them having to turn on a VPN. Because who likes dealing with VPN clients? Like end users hate those things. And they cost a ton of money too, from, a, uh, from kind of an operational and a capital perspective. So the way this works, you have this set of uh, what are called app proxy connectors. They're little agents that run on member servers that run behind the firewall. You have at least a couple of them, because if one of them dies, you want things to keep working. And what they do is they make a pool of outbound connections to Azure AD. You publish apps in Azure AD that sit behind these connectors. What the connector does is it uses Kerberos constrained delegation to authenticate on behalf of the user. But you change the DNS record to point to this location in Azure. First, I sign into Azure AD. I pass all the security roles that we've defined there. We'll talk about what those are in a minute. Then I get proxied back through this tunnel down to the application. The nice thing about this, I've got no inbound holes in the firewall. I have no need for people to have a VPN client so that I can say they've done two-factor, for example. And they get access to all their applications with the same URLs that they're used to, uh, they're used to using. Um, each of these connectors handles something in the neighborhood of 1,000 requests a second. So from a scale perspective, you can put a whole lot of apps behind not a lot of, uh, not a lot of compute resources. There's also tie-ins with, uh, with the Edge app that runs on your phone where it can actually translate internal URLs that are published through this. There's tie-ins with, um, with the Outlook app as well if people are using Outlook Mobile. So if you get an internal short URL, it knows how to translate it to get it through, a, uh, through the app proxy. Uh, yes, does the password filler thing work with app proxy? It does. So if you have this old siloed application that runs behind the firewall that everybody signs into with some random username and password that has nothing to do with anything else, you can publish that web application through the app proxy, and you can say that it's a form fill application. So once they get through there, they can vault their, vault their credentials 
and IE or Chrome will fill them in and hit the go button or the login button, whatever that button is, and magically they'll be into the app without needing to know their creds. Um, so this is a kind of recap. This is one of my favorite little unsung hero features and the kind of the things it can do. And it's really easy. The nice thing about it too is that you don't have to make any changes to the app or how people access it. So it's really easy to pilot as well. You can run this side by side, figure out all the, uh, figure out what you need to know, and then you can figure out the transition to it. In terms of, uh, in terms of when it doesn't work, so knowing how curb delegation works, which, uh, it was one of those sessions I used to do at the, the tech or deck days uh, way back when, but it seems to uh, have reared its head of something useful to, uh, to know again. Um, Netmon or Wireshark, whatever your, uh, whatever your network trace tool of, uh, tool of choices can, can be handy. And then that same Fiddler tool I talked about a couple, uh, couple slides back is, uh, is super helpful as well. And the reason for Fiddler is that what you'll have to figure out is that Every path that gets accessed when you go to one of these apps has to be published through the uh, published through the app proxy. So the typical scenario is I publish like a corporate intranet and I go to it the first time and none of the images load because it turns out they're coming from this totally other place over here that I need to know I need to publish. I think Joe, you had a whole session on this that I boiled down to one slide. Is that that's fair? Yep. Yeah. Um, so for those of you that uh, that weren't there. Um, this is, uh, this is one of those features, conditional access, that Microsoft is just continuously, uh, continuously investing in. And the idea here is that for every sign-in to an app or service that's connected to Azure AD, I get to define policy about who can access it, when they can access it, and how they can access it. And these are, uh, these are typically have been security controls that are really, really hard to implement, for, especially for on-premises stuff. Um, that you can point and click through a, uh, through a GUI and define these controls really easily. So it can be simple things like, if you're accessing this app, you need to do multi-factor authentication, done. That's a really simple one, but what if I wanna key on, what kind of device are you coming from? Are you coming from a device that we know about? Are you coming from a device that's compliant and healthy with our policies? Maybe if you're using Windows Defender, is that app, is that device healthy, is that device secure? This is really important data that we're saying in this application. So let's make sure about that before we let you in. Or a classic one is, if you're coming from an IP range that we know about, we won't make you do multi-factor authentication. That's a little sticky sometimes, but it's really, really common in terms of what, uh, what people do with this. Or you might layer on identity protection and say, you know, if you're coming from a high risk sign-in, and this is a really high risk application, we're just not gonna let you in because we're not comfortable with that. But if it's a low or medium risk sign-in, maybe as long as you do multi-factor auth, you're good to go. So all these things with these conditional access policies, these apply to native Microsoft workloads, so Office 365, Exchange Online, SharePoint, and so forth. They apply to any application that you federate with Azure AD. So whether that's your Salesforces, your ServiceNows, or even something that you build in-house. And then they also apply to all those on-premises apps that you publish with the application proxy. So this now takes the story where people say that, well, I need VPN because it's doing device health or it's requiring two-factor before I can get to, get to all these apps. I can use the app proxy. I can combine that with conditional access. I get those same tests, and I guarantee you probably a whole lot more than you're doing or can even do with, uh, with the VPN solution that you have today. And then uh, kind of the last one, which is something that uh, is the, how Microsoft's getting the hook here, is they have this concept of app-enforced controls. And in practice, what that means is send a little hint to something like SharePoint or Exchange and tell them where the user is coming from and what they can do. So the, uh, the main scenario for that today is maybe you're coming from an unknown device. We're not going to let you download anything when you go to SharePoint or OneDrive. And that's where, uh, as you look at competing services to this, this is where they've got that hook that nobody else has. Um, you can figure out most of the ones on top with, uh, 
with some of the other vendors that are out there, but that hook where you're sending a hint to a native Microsoft workload, that's unfortunately the, uh, the closed ecosystem. Uh, you know, the benefit or the, the lack thereof, depending on how you look at it. So another one that's new, and there's a, a session right after mine, I think, that's all about this. Um, for a long time when you did self-service password reset with Azure AD, if you went through that mechanism and you put a really crappy password in, it would tell you, sorry, but we've seen that one before and you can't use it. And people love this because they could block things like winter 2018 and in 45 days when their password expires, that puts us right around January, it'll be winter 2019. And it turns out these passwords are really vulnerable to things like password spray attacks, and other sorts, of, uh, other sorts of attacks against them. So Microsoft added this concept where they were looking for these things and blocking them dynamically. But if you weren't using SSPR or people were also able to change their password on premises, you lost the value of that, of that capability. And so with this Azure AD password protection service, you install an agent on all your domain controllers that agent uses something called a password filter. If you want to get down into the weeds, password filters get to intercept every plain text password that comes through a domain controller before it gets set. And it takes this dynamic list of bad passwords that Microsoft knows about. It does some funny math in them to also find variations. And then you get to put a list in there of all the ones specific to your organization that you don't want to go in. So if... Um, if I'm Contoso, for example, I'd probably want to block the word Contoso. I might want to block uh, whatever city we're headquartered in. I guess New York, we'll call it, because uh, we're there today. And you can put a list of, I think, up to 1,000 different words on top of the dynamic list that Microsoft has. You get to block as well. And this starts to really help with the fatigue that password X3 policies and password complexity rules create, because we're all human. And naturally, we figure out ways around that to make passwords that we can remember. And unfortunately, the bad guys, uh, the bad guys are pretty good at that too. And, uh, and when you add those two together, you end up with things happening that you'd rather not have happening. Um, so this is super easy to deploy. It's an agent that installs on all your domain controllers. It's a member server or two that hosts the, uh, hosts the connection with Azure AD, so your domain controllers don't need internet, a internet access. And you can run that either in audit mode, or you're just getting telemetry about how many hits are we getting. We can get an idea of this thing's going to be useful, if there's potentially some communication we need. And then you can turn it into enforce mode, and that's when it starts blocking, uh, blocking things. One of the questions I get all the time about this is, well, can I find out what that list is that Microsoft's blocking so I can tell everybody not to use that in their passwords? And the answer is no. Because uh, if I told the bad guys, you know what, you can't use these thousand words in your passwords, that'll make their job a heck of a lot easier too. Yep. So traditionally, one of the problems with the password filter is that the message that comes back is very generic. Has, has, have they changed that behavior at all, or is it just saying that the password doesn't comply with the policy? Yeah, so the question was, when I put a bad password in today, I get this kind of generic message back from Windows that says, your password doesn't comply, and it could be one of these four things. We're not really going to tell you which one, so good luck figuring it out. Exactly. Um, and the answer with this is you get the exact same message with this that you did before. If you set your password through Azure AD self-service password change or reset, it gives a better message, but it is still d deliberately vague. We have a couple of customers that are using this. Are they getting a lot of false positives for help desk? Like, I'm putting in an uppercase, lowercase exclamation, and it's still not working. So the question was, are they getting false positives to the help desk? I think people are getting some, but by and large, people just keep hacking at that thing until they, uh, until they get one. Yeah. Um, so number eight, this is one that, that's been around for a while, but I think a lot of people don't know about. So we talked about using things like conditional access policies so I can require a multi-factor auth to a, uh, to a cloud service, to a traditional web application. But then there's this whole class of services and systems that 
that pretty much everybody has on premises, and either they have two factor today with something like an RSA fob or a semantic VIP, uh, or they don't have two factor at all, which is bad. But uh, I think we can uh, we can all agree on that. That same Azure MFA service that people register for for cloud applications has a plugin for the Windows Radius service, which is called NPS or Network Protection Service. Maybe we'll just call it NPS. Um, when you plug that plugin in. Every single auth request that goes through the NPS server now goes out to Azure MFA and triggers an MFA request. So now you can point your VPN concentrators, remote desktop gateways, Citrix net scalers, F5 APMs, all those things that use Radius for auth to these NPS servers, and you start getting two-factor for those systems. One thing to know about this, when you install it, every auth request that goes through the NPS server starts going through MFA. So you probably don't want to install it on NPS servers that you have already. Stand up some new ones, get this working, swing everything over, and then you can shut the old ones down. So if it doesn't work, you'll just kind of break everything. Um, troubleshooting for this thing, Netmon or Wireshark is going to be your friend. It doesn't have much in the way of useful logging. Um, so for the most part, it works pretty well. But uh, network traces are typically how you, uh, how you troubleshoot this thing. But ideally, at the end of the day, you've got two-factor for those traditional on-premises entry points. And if you're using another MFA solution, you don't have people registered for both. And then if your Microsoft salesman has already sold you everything we've talked about, and you have EMS E3 or you have Azure AD Premium P1, the next thing for them to make their number is to sell you the next iteration, which is Azure AD P2 or EMS E5. Um, one of the features that's in there is something called identity protection. Identity protection takes signals or data from all the, all the sign-ins that Microsoft's processing, not just from your tenant. And we're looking at, or they're looking at, what are patterns that we can see that might score the risk of one of these sign-ins, for example? When you turn this data on, you get a great dashboard that's telling you what's going on, but you also get the ability to create conditional access policies that score based on risk. And you get to turn something called a user risk policy on, which lets you take action if Microsoft detects that that user account is potentially threatened or compromised. So the, uh, the really classic example of this is when those leaked credential reports hit the internet, Microsoft has a way of acquiring those. They feed all those through the system. If you're doing password hash sync and your user's email address and password matches from one of those lists to what's been synced to, uh, to Azure AD, they show up in what's called the leaked credentials report, which tells you that there's a match there. And when you layer on this user risk policy with identity protection, I can force a password reset on the next sign-in automatically. I can force that user to be blocked until they call the help desk or some combination thereof. So there's a ton of really cool data here. Um, one thing I do with customers, I have them turn the 30-day trial on. When they get to the end of that 30 days, a lot of people are freaking out typically. So there's some really cool, uh, cool data here. And uh, it's one way to see that, uh, see that you may be at more risk than you thought you were once you see what's, uh, what's in there. And then my last one here is outbound provisioning. So this is, uh, if anyone's used this before, in the beginning of the summer, late spring, they probably had a lot of trouble with this thing. It's been more or less fixed, but what it, uh, what it does is take, there's about 20 or 30 SaaS applications that Microsoft has actually built connectors for from Azure AD to that application. And now rather than having silos from a governance perspective in my Salesforce and ServiceNow in Dropbox and Google Apps and so forth, I can take on-premises identity data. I can map that directly to these applications. Now anytime anything changes in my Active Directory, Azure AD will sync that downstream to these applications. So that can be as simple as just syncing user data. It can also be mapping roles. So I take security groups that map to roles that exist in these applications. I can govern those with the existing processes that I have and automatically sync those to these applications so they don't have these identity and governance silos that these cloud applications typically represent. So there's, I think there's 20 or 30 of those today. If you have something that speaks skim, there's also a generic connector you can build that, uh, 
build that connector out of the box or semi out of the box through, uh, through the UI as well. And uh, like I said, if you used this before and noticed that it took forever, that's been, uh, that's been dramatically uh, dealt with. So just, um, just kind of wrapping up here. So as far as like 10 things to do here, the first really, really important thing is I've got to have on-premises infrastructure that's backing my cloud identity ecosystem that's secure and that I can trust. If I don't have that, everything that happens downstream is in that same, uh, that same predicament that I'm in with the source data. Self-service password reset, solving those help desk calls, reducing those help desk calls is great. Privileged identity management lets me take all of that permanent access that my administrators and IT people have and turn that into temporary access that they only have when they need it. Single sign-on, I think we all know, uh, know what that is, but making sure that people don't have silos of passwords, that they don't have anything other than one credential to get to all the things that they need to. The Azure App Proxy lets me publish on-premises workloads without having holes in the firewall and lets me apply conditional access policies that let me take apply intelligence to who can access what, when they can access it, and how they can access it. Azure AD password protection lets me take not just complexity rules about uppercase letters, lowercase letters, and so forth, but find passwords and patterns of passwords that we know are bad and make sure people aren't using those. And then MFA for our on-premises services, that's taking that MFA investment that we've made for web applications, for SaaS application, extending that to things like VPN, uh, Citrix, and so forth, anything that speaks, uh, speaks radius. And then finally, identity protection is telemetry and data above and beyond just about who's signing into what, but about the risks associated with that and the actions that we can take um, based on those risks. And finally, uh, outbound provisioning, being able to take governance and processes that we have with our on-premises identity and applying those to, uh, to SaaS applications and making sure that those don't turn into, uh, don't turn into identity silos. So I know I am just about at time. I uh, really appreciate everybody listening to this. I'll be up here for a bit, happy to talk. I apologize for the, uh, the technical glitches at the, uh, at the beginning, but hopefully this was, uh, hopefully this was useful and uh, creates things that, uh, that you can do in your organization.